Award-winning author John Meacham in conversation with Professor Lagavall. They both bring their own perspective and their sense of history uh, to this important uh, figure in American history, this time in our, in our politics as well, and uh, certainly both anxious to take your questions. So we look forward to this uh, conversation. The Institute of Politics, of course, since 1966 was established as President Kennedy's living memorial to inspire Harvard students to politics and public service. So on this day after President's Day, we look forward to this conversation. Uh, we thank Fred and John for joining us and I'll turn it over to John as our distinguished moderator. Thank you both. Thank you, Mark. I still call Mark Mr. President because of his uh, collegiate president days where he ran one of the two Episcopal universities in the country. I went to the other, uh, the University of the South. But since there are only six Episcopalians left, Mark had a particularly valuable position uh, in our tiny little, little firmament. Uh, I'm honored to be here with uh, my friend and colleague, Fred. Uh, Fred and I both, I think, see President's Day as we see Christmas which is 12 days. We just roll forward to a kind of epiphany. So uh, honored to be here, uh, huge admirer of both the history of the uh, beginning of the Vietnam conflict and now the Kennedy biography. So Fred, I will ask you, um, I'm gonna make you do both your biographer work, but also your applied history uh, work as well. But tell me uh, a quick superlative question. What surprised you the most in doing the first volume of the Kennedy set? You know, I think John, and by the way, it's great to be with you for this. And I'm grateful for this chance. Also great thanks to, to Mark and the, the crew at the JFK Junior Forum. Um, I think maybe what surprised me the most, John, was that Kennedy, that JFK was a more serious student of, uh, of in history and of international affairs at an earlier point than I thought. I knew from previous books and maybe from my early research that he was frankly a bit of a slacker. Uh, at Choate, he didn't really apply himself very much. Early on here at Harvard, he also didn't really work that hard. And I just thought, well, this is a guy who, as many people have suggested, doesn't really become focused on his career and on politics until he's in the House, maybe not even until he's in the Senate. And I think what stunned me, and here I just want to say that the materials at the Kennedy Library, just fabulous, um, because though we've, we no longer have a lot of the papers that he wrote at, at Choate, especially, but even at Harvard, we have some of them. Mm -hmm. And I think what they show me is that this is a guy in the late 1930s, mid and late 30s. The United States is going through a depression. There's a rising threat from Nazi Germany and from Japan. <clears throat> this is a young, young man who's thinking a lot about especially the challenges of democracy in ways that I think will continue through his life. It's a theme in volume one of this book and uh, I think resonate for us today. So I think if I, that's maybe the one thing I would single out uh, that surprised me. <clears throat> Now, his father, of course, uh, as he said of Martin Luther King, we all have fathers, don't we? Uh, has a much more complicated internet reputation uh, in terms of foreign policy. Talk about Ambassador Kennedy's influence, both on the son's interest, but then the impact of the ambassador's isolationism on that career. Yeah, I mean, he's a towering figure in the lives of his children, all nine of the kids. Uh, and they will say, many of them, in subsequent oral histories that, uh, that their mother would kind of recede a little bit into the background whenever Joe Sr. was home, because he was this kind of powerful presence. Uh, I think Jack was very devoted to him, and he was devoted to Jack, so they had a close relationship. Um, and he, was, he resembled his father in some ways, but actually was closer to his mother, I think, overall in personality. What's interesting about this, and, that your, and your question gets at this, is that, of course, as we get into World War II, as the war begins in 1939, there is a debate here in the United States between so-called isolationists and interventionists about what should happen. Uh, the two Kennedys, in this case, Joe Sr. and Jack, begin to part uh, company. 
uh, that the father, as you say, is an arch appeaser, even after Neville Chamberlain uh, begins to say, wait a minute, this thing didn't really work. And he switches to a strategy of deterrence. Joe Kennedy as ambassador remains committed to the appeasement position. We should make a deal with Hitler. Um, and long before that, as I think I show in the book, uh, Jack concludes as a, a student here, a junior and a senior, that isolationism is probably untenable for the United States, that we have to probably at some point intervene. We certainly need to prepare for intervention. And the last thing I'll just say here, John, is that I do give Joe Kennedy credit for allowing not just Jack, but all of the kids to chart their own path, even though he had this powerful persona. He never insisted that they had to follow his views or their, his plans for their careers. Um, and Jack didn't, unlike his older brother, Joe Jr., who stuck very close to the father's positions. Jack didn't. So talk a little bit more about the roots of that internationalist sensibility. Uh, teachers, books, uh, experience. Uh, yeah. The book is uh, quite detailed on that. Yeah, I mean, it's partly that, um, it's partly that he's sick a lot as a kid. Uh, and in those days, kids couldn't do very much except, you know, read books. Uh, if they're in bed all the time, there isn't much else to do. And he became a very passionate reader. He might have been that anyway. But I do think that the illnesses contributed to that. And here again, uh, credit to his mom. Rose Kennedy encouraged that bookish side of her son. And he had that in a way that none of the other kids had, by the way. Uh, Jack was the one who looked things up. Jack was the one who devoured books. So I think it comes partly from that. It comes partly from, as you say, his teachers, both at Choate, but especially at Harvard, uh, professors that he took that encouraged this view in him. It's, it struck me, one of the surprising things in my research was that the student body here was staunchly isolationist. Mm -hmm. You know, something like 90, 95% when, they, when the Harvard Crimson would do, would do surveys. Uh, a huge majority said, we want nothing to do with this European war. This is a war they should fight themselves. Very much a Joe Kennedy kind of position. Jack parted company, as we've said, from, uh, from this view. And then the last thing I would say, last contributor to, contributor to this uh, internationalist sensibility is his travels. The beginning in a serious way with Lem Billings, his close friend in 1937, where they spent several months in Europe. Uh, especially his quite astonishing study abroad uh, adventure in 1939, just as the war is about to begin in Europe. That one's about seven months. Um, and various other trips that he takes, I think are of profound importance in terms of making him see a complex world, make him comfortable with a complex world in a way his father never was, comfortable with competing visions of national interest that I find really interesting. And again, I think uh, we can see continue really into the presidency, um, but having their roots here. One of the things that I'm obsessed with uh, is the sense of an impact and feel of the passage of time yeah. in the lives of our biographical subjects. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, to me, President Kennedy feels like a remote figure. And I now realize, we were talking before, the students I teach at Vanderbilt, Ronald Reagan is like Woodrow Wilson. Talk a little bit about the ambient reality. It was only 20 years between 1940 and his President Kennedy applying the, the notion of a long twilight struggle. Did he carry these lessons in a daily sense because they were closer in, in, in time? Uh, I ask this because, and this is a little bit beyond where, where you are at this point, but I continue to be fascinated by his capacity and uh, Robert Kennedy's capacity to stand up so to the generals in the military during the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
when their father had been on the wrong side of that. I've always been riveted by the human drama there. Um, so when he was moving through the House and the Senate and heading toward 1960, was World War II and the gathering storm, as Churchill called it, was that as real to him as something, say, 20 years ago would be to us? I think it was. I think there's no question about this. And, and by the way, of course, he was far from alone in this. I think many of those men who served, whether in the Pacific or in Europe, and he, he of course, served in, in, the, in the Solomons. He was in the Pacific Theater. I think it had a, a, a life-altering effect on them. And I think he came out of the war uh, with two sort of broad convictions that I think speak to your point and that I think are really important. The first was, and there's in some ways almost contradictory, John. The first was that I think he came out skeptical of the utility, the utility of military force hmm. to settle political problems. Uh, his little, letters home little, from the Pacific little, are pretty Joseph interesting Heller, in this regard. Little Joseph Heller amid the... <laughs> No question. Little Joseph Heller, maybe quite a lot of it. So if you look at his letters home, you see this. And I found this really interesting. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, we may talk a little bit about the presidency uh, later, but I think you see that skepticism come out at key points in terms of his presidential decision making. Um, but the second conclusion I think he drew from, from the war was that the United States, whenever this thing is over, he is saying in 43 and 44, the United States must play a leadership position in world affairs. It cannot do, this is Jack's interpretation, JFK's interpretation, it cannot do what it did after World War I, which in his view was to basically withdraw, to not seize that uh, mantle of leadership. He's now saying again in letters and in some of his writings in 43, 44, and 45, we can't uh, make that mistake again. But the point I'm making is that I think as you say, it's just 20 years. You make a really good point. It's a short period of time between, let's say, Pearl Harbor and his inauguration, slightly less than 20 years, I guess. It's not really. 20, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's about 19. Yeah. Um, it's with him every single day. There's no question about it. And even as he makes political decisions necessary to win the White House, I think he's thinking about this continuously, no question. So something else to sort of begin to push us in the in analogy land. Um, describe his relationship both to Joe McCarthy hmm. and to McCarthyism. Yeah. You know, um, there's just a lot here that I didn't know when I started the research. For example, maybe it, it, your, your question earlier about what surprised me in the research. Here's another one. I did not know that the family relationship with Joe McCarthy was as close as it was. I knew, of course, that, that Robert had worked for McCarthy, <clears throat> that he maintained a certain loyalty to McCarthy. I didn't know that Joe Sr. was so fond of Joe McCarthy and, by the way, remained to the end uh, deeply um, attached to Joe McCarthy. I didn't know that a couple of the sisters even dated McCarthy. So that close family connection, I think is important in terms of understanding JFK's position, which I'll talk about briefly in a second. The second thing, of course, is that Massachusetts has a very large number of Irish, Irish Catholic voters who remain committed to McCarthy right through to the end. Even after censure by the Senate in late 1954, it's pretty interesting to look at public opinion polling support for McCarthy, even nationally. Uh, talk about something that resonates in our own day. About a third of American voters, 36%, 37%, depending on the polling, mm -hmm. uh, are uh, loyal to McCarthy right through the century. Um, and that's, that has a certain resonance for me. All of it points to, doesn't excuse, but it helps to explain why John F. Kennedy was always handling McCarthy with kid gloves, why he was reluctant to really come out in firm opposition to him. Um, I think had he not been in the hospital in late 1954, I think he would have voted for censure. I have no doubt. 
But the fact is he didn't. He didn't indicate to Ted Sorensen, his, one of his chief uh, aides, uh, his position on the censure vote. He could have, but he chose not to do it. I think he was being very careful for these two reasons and caused himself, John, all kinds of grief with liberals in the party. Mrs. Roosevelt, maybe in particular, never quite, never quite, I think, could trust John F. Kennedy because she thought, among other things, she also didn't like the fact that she thought Joe Sr. was much too cozy with the Nazis uh, and was opposed to her husband uh, you know, later in World War II, but also this point that Jack Kennedy uh, did not come out and condemn McCarthy uh, when he when he should have when he should have done so. He was not, I think it's fair to say, a profile in courage uh, on McCarthy. You and I have talked about this privately. Was profiles in courage an act of penance? I think it was in part an act of penance. But as I also point out in the book, he had the idea for the book. Well, he, initially he thought it was going to be an article, and he said to Ted Sorensen, "Hey, Ted." Go, go find some sources uh, and, and let's do an article. Let's do, a, <laughs> let's do an article on this. He had that idea before things came to a head with McCarthy. Before the summer of 54, when McCarthy begins to nosedive and then the censure vote that fall, the, the book idea or certainly the article idea already existed. So I wouldn't want to make the point too strongly, but at least in part, even if we don't put it at the top of the causal hierarchy, Yes, this is in part, I think, an effort, even if he wouldn't admit it, to make amends for failing to do what he should have done with McCarthy. Right. And also, as you, as you point out, uh, you know, his, I find the introduction to be the most interesting part oh. of the book, because it's basically saying, don't judge us. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and that's the, that's the part of the book, that and the concluding chapter yeah. are the part of the book where JFK's own imprint is strongest. Yeah. I conclude, uh, I think I'm right about this, that we should not say that this was just a ghost written work by Ted Sorensen. Yes, it's true that those middle chapters, the case studies of the individual senators, that's mostly the work of Sorensen along with input from some distinguished historians, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Alan Nevins, uh, Jules David, and some others. But the intro, as you say, and the conclusion, that's JFK to people um, because they speak in some ways to our current moment about the importance of, uh, of uh, good faith bargaining between the parties, the, the importance of compromise in a, in a democracy, the importance of reasoning from evidence. It's all there and it's kind of timeless in a way. So I, well, I'm looking forward to your, in, in volume two, your analysis of what I continue to believe is the most interesting document from a president about being president, which was the introduction that uh, I haven't looked at the documents, but I would bet a good bit of money that Arthur wrote the first draft and, and Kennedy fixed it. Uh, the introduction to Sorensen's lectures uh, on decision-making in, in the White House. And if the students here don't know it, it it's a remarkable document. Uh, oh, no question. About how, what it's actually like to be president. But in terms of the presidency itself, as we, we leave him off as he's beginning to move into that act of his life, uh, we all have archetypal presidents in our minds. Uh, who were Kennedy's? What, what was his imaginative relationship with FDR, with Truman? Um, and then I want to ask you about what I think is one of the great political feats uh, in American history, which was how Arthur, Ted, and, and John Kennedy turned Eisenhower into a uh, passive president, which would have surprised, for instance, con conservative Republicans. It certainly would have. Uh, and we should talk about that. You know, his relationship with FDR is interesting because um, I looked for this. You know, you, you and I, we both, you know, we scour the archives and we're looking for certain things as historians and biographers do. I wanted to know in this magnificent collection at the Kennedy Library and elsewhere, what the young JFK uh, thought of Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary that, you know, when he passed in 1945, so many Americans, 
it was he was the only president they had ever known. I, I think I suggest in 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 that chapter that Robert Kennedy was seven years old when Franklin Roosevelt became president. Uh, and you know, Jack was older. But the point is, he's such a huge part of their lives, such a huge part of American history in this period, and of the world. You know, it's it's striking to me that many people around the world refer to FDR as the president. They didn't, they didn't have to say President Roosevelt. He's the president. So I looked for anything that would suggest that, that um, Jack Kennedy thought one way or the other about FDR. There isn't much. Um, I don't think I conclude from that that Roosevelt didn't, uh, how should I put it? didn't speak to him in a sort of direct way. He didn't form that close uh, a connection with Roosevelt. Maybe this is in part because FDR and Joe Kennedy have a falling out, but that happens a little later. That's really more 39, 40. Even before then, I don't see that much of a, of a, of a, of a draw, if I can put it that way, to, uh, to FDR. That said, I think that the young Kennedy um, was proud of the fact that his father served in the administration. Uh, he certainly supported the major elements of the New Deal, both then and later. Um, but that's an interesting uh, view of FDR and also a complicated view of FDR's war leadership, but maybe I'll leave that for now. Um, Truman, uh, I think he was initially had a low view of, of Truman. I cite some of that evidence, but I think he came to see Truman as, as an honorable, uh, uh, president, somebody who cared a lot about the country, who made good decisions more often than bad decisions. I think he revised his view of, of Truman. Probably the, the president that he drew on the most, this won't surprise you, was Lincoln. Um, he said to Sorensen quite often, I want us to study Lincoln's speeches, not only for the delivery, for the, for the phraseology, for the fact that he could say so, so much with so few words, um, but also in terms of the, the, the content of his leadership uh, and what made him as important as he was. And I think so he wanted to study Lincoln in a way that at least to this point, I have not seen him really want to engage with any um, other uh, American president. But the other person maybe I'll mention is John Quincy Adams. He had a particular interest, I think, in mm -hmm. Adams uh, and read what a lot of historians had written about Adams uh, and was fascinated by Adams, you know, his trajectory, how he ends up in the house after all is said and done and, and so forth, uh, an interest in Adams as well. Well, part, I wonder too, if part of this was Given Kennedy, so Lincoln was again to go back to our sense of time. Yeah. Let's see. So the difference between was fifth again in about fifty years, right? Uh, from Lincoln's death to Kennedy's birth. Yeah, and a hundred years until between the two inaugurations. Exactly right. right. Yeah. And Roosevelt would have been a bit more current. Yeah, because he knew Roosevelt. Yeah, and knew you know, but so uh, as Harry Truman once said, uh, "Heroes always know when to die." <laughs> so maybe he just hadn't been dead long enough. Um, talk about the Eisenhower thing. Um, yeah. This is a pet theory of mine. Uh, yeah. I, I offer, I just venture it as kind of a uh, a forum opinion, not a well thought out one. But one of the speeches that I find really riveting in American history uh, is John Kennedy announcing his candidacy at the National Press Club in yeah. January of 60. Yeah. Because it became conventional historical yeah. wisdom that yeah. we were not moving and he would make us move. That's right. Yeah, and, and says time and time again. I mean, it's amazing how, how much he talks about getting the country moving. We need to get moving. We need to do better. Um, and it's a, it's, it's really the mantra of the, of the presidential campaign. You know, it's interesting because as I show in the book in volume one, he had really high regard for Eisenhower. In fact, in his diary in 1945, when he's a journalist, uh, and is at Potsdam in the summer of 45, and he either meets Eisenhower, I couldn't quite nail down if they actually shook hands or, 
mm-hmm. or if they were just in proximity. But he waxes lyrical about General Eisenhower and how he carries himself and, you know, the, the gravitas and the fact that this is a guy who uh, is a huge world figure. I think he continues to respect Eisenhower in the years thereafter. They meet occasionally um, uh, when Kennedy is um, uh, preparing to run for the Senate. They meet in Paris, for example. Uh, uh, And then, as I think you're suggesting, John, when he's running, and it really begins in a serious way, I think, in 58, but then in 59 and 60, they begin to portray the administration um, uh, in a very different light. Um, And I think they succeed certainly by Richard Nixon's estimation, who's going to be the, the opponent in 1960, they succeed in, pain, in, in portraying the Eisenhower term in, 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 in administration in very different terms. And it works for them. Uh, and, and um, you know, it's a very close election, which means any, any one of, you know, seven different things could be seen as decisive. But I think that the, the degree to which Kennedy proved able to suggest this is a time for new leadership. We need to get the country moving. We're entering into a very difficult, dangerous phase of the Cold War, uh, and I'm your man. Uh, in contrast to the to the old the old golfer in the White House, uh, it worked, no question. Let me ask you one more specific question about Kennedy, the legislature. Questions of racial justice. Place him on the on the spectrum for us. The pre-presidential Kennedy. He's he's not particularly active as a legislator. Um, you know, in the House, and I'm not the first to say this, but in the House, you have the sense that he almost from day one is thinking about the Senate uh, and is not particularly um, aggressive in promoting uh, legislation. Uh, I think he wins respect in the House and certainly in the Senate for knowing his stuff. He's knowledgeable on the issues, prides himself on studying up on uh, both foreign policy and domestic legislation. He's always more interested in foreign policy, no question. But, but you know, he's, he's, he's got a solid, if unspectacular, record generally. I think that's fair to say also with respect to the Senate. Uh, mm-hmm. There are a few issues housing, including for veterans, um, to some extent, anti-poverty legislation. He's interested in tax issues to a degree. Um, And with civil rights, uh, again, something that surprised me in the research, he actually has a very good record on civil rights in terms of his voting record in the House and up through, I would say, 55 and into 56 in the Senate. He's really quite progressive on civil rights legislation. Does it mean that he feels the the discrimination of African-Americans in a a deep way, that he cares a lot about the daily injustices that they're suffering? I don't think so. I don't think it resonates with him in that way. But I do think the record is quite good. He begins to shift, interestingly enough, in 56, when he becomes a, a, a possibility for the vice presidential slot under Stevenson. Then he moves to the right because he thinks I've got to be palatable to Southerners. And as, as you know, uh, Southern Democrats are, are supreme in Congress in that year, control most of the key committees. And so you can see it's quite overt actually. JFK shifting to the right uh, in hopes of getting that vice presidential nomination. And it's really not until, I need to research this further, but I would say, John, it's in 62, and of course, especially in 63, that he really does begin to shift on civil rights in a very important direction. I think the speech in June, I don't know if you agree with me on this, I'd love to hear what you think, but I think the, the June speech from the Oval Office, about 13 minutes in length, which I commend to all of you who are with us tonight, it's a very important speech. It makes civil rights a moral issue in a way that it had not been uh, before. I don't know, what, what, what do you think? I agree. Um, I think the Lincoln analogy is important here and yeah. the parallelism is striking. Yeah. Lincoln wasn't good on, these, on this until 63. Mm-hmm. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. 63. Um, 
I don't want to be numerological about it, but, <laughs> but there, there's that parallel. Um, I was struck by, in writing about John Lewis recently, yeah, how sure. Robert Kennedy said to John Lewis, uh, John, you and the students of the South have taught me, now I understand. Mm -hmm. And that was the close, uh, that was, 62 into 63 after the freedom rides interestingly and this is one of the things that we live for so that that was the contemporary record on one of the anniversaries of president kennedy's death congressman lewis re-remembered the story that jfk had said that which he had not mm. which is striking right uh no, totally interesting. No intentional sin, but in the in the sweep of sentiment and memory, yeah. Congressman Lewis kind of sure. wanted his president <laughs> to have learned from him. Well, and, uh, it's it's that's totally interesting. It tells you something about how 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 our memories um, can play tricks on us. But the other point that I just want to make here in this context, John, is that. There's no doubt that Robert, I think you agree with this. Robert's really important here. I think that, um, you know, absent his advocacy in the key months uh, in this period in the administration, I'm not sure that we get that speech. I'm not sure that we get JFK shifting in the way that he does. Others, you know, Harris Wofford and, and others in the administration, obviously, of course, deserve credit as well. But but Robert needs to get his due here, and I'll I'll write about that obviously. So I'll go ahead and say in front of everyone what I'm going to inflict on you in private when you get to this point. Yeah. In volume two, and I think there's a whole separate book at some point on this. Uh, that day, hmm. which is June 11th, 1963, yep. begins with Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. Kennedy speaks, and then Medgar Evers is murdered in Jackson, Mississippi, two hours later. So the whole sweep yeah. is in a less than a 24-hour time period. So uh, I know you appreciate my literary. Well, I, I, and, and, and and no, it's, it's a really good point. And of course, on June 10th, the day before, we've got the American University speech. Yes. Which in, in Cold War terms is I think of, of profound importance. One of the things that I wanna grapple with again in this next volume is what happens to the Cold War in that year following the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and the speech at American University is really one of the great presidential speeches I think of, of, of say the last three quarters of a century. And you know, uh, it speaks themes, articulates themes that Kennedy actually has articulated in some other uh, speeches including in Seattle, for example, in the fall of 61, even the inaugural address, there's a certain resonance there. But, but yes, just to add to, to what you're saying, June 10th and 11th, my goodness. They're huge. And it's one of the, it was an insight that Richard Reeves had, um, one of your predecessors in this field, yeah. which is that presidents don't say, deal with civil rights today and the economy tomorrow yeah. and foreign policy on Thursday. Right. It's just it's this tsunami. And that's why, again, I commend this essay that, that Kennedy published. In, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, by the way, it's, by the way, a great strength of Richard Reeves' approach that he yeah. brought that home, I think, in a way that I think we hadn't considered before, the degree to which on any given day or day after day, uh, they have to deal with these things, um, um, you know, together. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal human insight. I, I had this experience a little bit with George H.W. Bush's diary was dictated into tape recorders. Mm. So you, in listening to it, you're living through this experience with him. And oh, he yeah. was always very early in the morning when he had a lot of coffee and was kind of up or late at night with the vodka and he wasn't so up. <laughs> and just the panoply of issues yeah. and jumping around. And you think about it and it's, um, it, it's what I think makes your work so important is is you do feel you're behind the desk in a, in a coherent way um before we go to questions i want a, a last question um 
as a, and again, I'm, I'm having you jump ahead a little bit, but uh, 60 years on, uh, Kennedy up, down in her historical reputation? I have, a, I have a theory, but I won't inflict uh, it. Well, I, I, you have to articulate that theory for us, uh, but I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, he holds pretty steady in, in periodic polls that come out, uh, including polls of the general public, um, which I think is interesting, by the way, in part because, uh, as I allude, I think I suggest this in the preface to, the, to volume one, it's interesting that during his presidency, in the summer of 63, for example, he has, he has very high approval ratings, including, by the way, among Republicans. So this is not just a function of the assassination, the tragedy of Dallas, the glamour of the White House, the fact that he, he's forever young in our imaginations. I think all of those things matter. But it's also that with his policy decisions, with his speech making, with the inspirational nature of his, of his uh, rhetoric, uh, I think it resonated with people at the time and I think people since. Historians, I think, are more skeptical. Uh, uh, for one thing, it's such a short presidency. It's a thousand days. And most of the people that we think of as great presidents had to go through a war, or maybe it's the Depression, or maybe it's both. Um, I do think, though, as you know, John, having read it, um, I present a flawed figure, mm -hmm. a gifted and flawed figure, but I do think he had greatness within him. Um, and so maybe that's what I would say in terms of uh, his historical reputation. But you gotta, you got to tell us what, what your own oh, sense very is. Quickly. I, I think if you save the world from Armageddon, you get to be in the top whatever yep. you yeah. Um, I honestly think that the Cuban Missile Crisis is one of the great hours of statesmanship uh, ever, given the stakes. No question. And I've just recently been going through the tapes. Uh, as you know, the XCOM meetings were, were taped, uh, most of them. And um, suffice it to say that I fully share your view. Uh, and many others have, have, of course, argued the same. But I do think, I mean, one of the things that is just amazing in these transcripts and tapes is that he's quite literally sometimes the only one in the room yeah. who is preaching the need for a political solution. He's the only one who has the empathetic notion that we've got to put ourselves in Khrushchev's shoes, everybody. We've got to try to see how, how he sees this. Uh, uh, and I think as the, the cliche goes, we can be grateful for the fact that he was president uh, during that crisis. No, a reminder of the centrality of politics and the root of the word, yeah, uh, which is right. these people. Um, couple, if you had uh, President Biden's ear right now, uh, we'll give a lesson or two on what he should take away from the Kennedy legacy. I think, I think uh, you know, it's interesting because I think Biden, and you know, you know this much better than I do, having, having uh, worked with Biden and, and helped uh, craft his speeches. So you can tell me if I, if I have this wrong. But in a sense, what I would want to say to President Biden is um, follow, what you, follow your instinct, which I think is to argue um, for the things that bring Americans together, together more than what sets them apart. And I think this is something that Kennedy stri strove to do. Uh, his was a message, it seems to me, of inclusion of mm -hmm. unity, uh, yeah, both as president and even earlier than that when he was in the House and the Senate. And I think that's also what Joe Biden wants to do. I think the, the emphasis that Kennedy placed on reasoning from evidence uh, and on uh, valuing expertise, even though it can get us into trouble. You know, David Halberstam called his book the best and the brightest. Uh, and it was the best and the brightest that got us, uh, you know, sucked into to the Vietnam War. It's so it, you know, it won't solve everything. But I think I think Biden uh, should hold to that. And I also believe, though it can seem quaint and naive in our current age, that Kennedy's emphasis on bargaining in good faith mm -hmm. with members of the opposing party. 
ultimately, I think our democracy is going to need that. We can say that it's pointless, uh, but I think Joe Biden believes, and I believe rightly, that at some point, maybe it's not today, maybe it's not tomorrow, maybe it's only a handful of people on the other side, but it's got to happen. And that's certainly something that Kennedy uh, uh, believed strongly, wrote about in Profiles in Courage. Even his, even his first book, uh, mm -hmm. Why England Slept, was in part about how do, you, how do you work as a leader in a democracy during times of crisis? This is something he thought a lot about. Excellent. Uh, we will now move to the audience. Uh, Ryan. Hi there. Hello. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I greatly enjoyed the book. Um, and I had a quick question about um, sort of the young Kennedy. Um, mm -hmm. Asking, um, I sense from your assessment that there's this sort of hunger for meaning, um, perhaps through the avenue of power um, in the early Kennedy. And I wonder by your assessment, um, was his early ambition sort of um, in his college years and, and closely beyond, was it the ambition um, tied to ambition for the ambition's sake? Or was it more closely um, resembling the sort of tie to a deeper sense of calling or a particularly, particularly lasting and enduring vision? Um, and then la one more question just to add on to that. Um, in, in talking about Robert, as, he, as you all mentioned before, uh, and there's definitely stories to be told there, um, it seems to be that in, in the sort of popular ire, his brand of liberalism has been the enduring one. Um, and I wonder, um, do you tack that to sort of the wistfulness of sort of the figure that never was or, or did not get to um, sort of the vision that was never fully you know, brought out and expressed? Or do you think um, there's something actually you know, deeply significant about that fact? Or also, if you even agree with the, my assessment of that. I just want to say, Ryan, thank you. I just want to say that I'm uh, very unhappy. Ryan just asked two better questions than I ask in 40 minutes. So uh, <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little grumpy here, but uh, I will defer to my colleague. Uh, that is not true. That is not true. <laughs> John, John, you're still learning. You're a young man. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get there. Uh, before too long. Um, no, excellent Garen, question. Get Ryan on the, on the rota here. <laughs> <laughs> um, great questions, Ryan, really. Um, I think, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a cop-out answer to your first question, but it's some of both. Uh, I do think he's an ambitious young man. Um, and even under that slacker mean, um, there is somebody who really wants to accomplish something and wants it because he's attracted to, I think, power uh, and sees himself from a pretty early, early age. By the way, before his older brother dies, I think he sees politics as a kind of calling for him. It's not simply because Joe Jr. is killed that Jack, I think, pursues a political career. And so I think he's attracted to this. He's watched his grandfather on the on, grandfather on his maternal side, the legendary Honey Fitz, Fitzgerald, wield power in Boston and Massachusetts. I think he wants some of that, but it's also, um, it's also, you know, a sense of public service that, that I think credit Rose and Joe for suggesting to their kids. Um, you know, you got to believe in something greater than yourselves. And, you know, they were wealthy enough by the time JFK was a, was a, you know, was 10 years old. They were already super, super wealthy. He could have been a beachcomber. He could have been somebody who sort of just goofed off and, and uh, you know, uh, he had a trust fund and they all did, but he didn't. And I think that's part of this as well. And so there is a kind of calling to public service. And with respect to your second question, I think I think uh, I don't disagree with you. I think that it's um, I think with respect to both Robert, I don't know if you were referring uh, mostly to Robert in your question, but I would respect with I would say with respect to both JFK and RFK, you know we we can't help but think what might have been. Uh, we can't help but imagine, given that they're both gunned down in the prime of certainly of their political lives. Uh, of, of what was missed and what we might have achieved um, had, they, uh, had they lived. I think even those who didn't share JFK's policies, 
maybe they were a Republican or, or maybe they were a conservative Democrat of a different kind of uh, uh, stripe. I think they too wonder what might have been uh, had, had he survived the Dallas shooting, uh, had RFK not been gunned down. Um, I don't know if that gets fully at your second question, but that's, that's at least the beginning of an answer, I hope. I don't know, John, would you say anything else? I'm still intimidated. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, think, um, I think there's an enormous amount of uh, nostalgic effect. I also think in the historiography, it's significant that uh, it was the more liberal members of Kennedy's inner circle who wrote the biggest and most important books early on. Um, that said, they also, and this is particularly the case for Senator Kennedy, but as, as Fred was just saying a moment ago, there was movement. Uh, Kennedy starts out yeah. basically doing everything he can to say, I'm not Adelaide Stevenson. Yeah. I'm not soft. Remember, the worst word was soft. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Fred has pointed out in, in, in different contexts, there's one passing allusion to domestic policy in the inaugural address. Yeah. Now, he saw himself as a commander in chief, which I yeah. think is one of the benefits of Fred's argument, which is in discover rediscovering this early internationalism. Yeah. You see this young man as president yeah. Yeah. who is continuing to reflect those concerns yeah. more than the domestic ones. And yet, as history has a way of doing, because of the remarkable um, courage in my native region, you know, this, the young people and brave black people of the South forced Kennedy into yeah. a position that he did not want to be in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one of the great counterfactuals is, would we have had a civil rights bill yeah. in 1964 yeah. without Dallas? Yeah, I think it's 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 huge. I do think, and I want to do more research on this, so this is tentative. But for both of you, um, I think Kennedy's role is more important than some have suggested. Uh, and I think Clay Rison uh, and one or two other people have persuaded me mm. that his actions in '63 are really important, which would suggest that we, yeah, we might have still had that bill, if not in 64, then in 65. I, I suspect we would have. Just one more point, John, on, on the inaugural address. You're right. One sentence, and you and I have talked about this before, one sentence, and even that's on domestic uh, affairs, and even that sentence was added at the last, at the last minute. And uh, it was I mean, how the world, ordinary. yes. It wasn't that we should do the right thing, it's how the world would see us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. That, was, that was what it was about. So Ryan, you don't have to study, you're done. Uh, Jack, no pressure, my friend, what you got? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for both being here. Um, and I was actually gonna build on what was kind of already being discussed. Um, and obviously it's all speculation, but my question was sort of relating uh, to JFK's development in regard to his motivation to further the cause of civil rights as a result of um, sort of this pushing from Robert that you mentioned earlier. Uh, and had the assassination not occurred, uh, do you think that he would have eventually gone to the lengths that his vice president did, um, like, like you mentioned earlier, to, to pass this bill in 64? Uh, or do you think he would have fallen short of that? Great. I, you know, I'll, I'll just say that I, uh, you know, uh, I think he would have. Uh, and by the way, I'll just make a quick point here about counterfactuals. Um, a lot of historians, including many of my dear colleagues in the history department here, uh, where I'm jointly appointed, I think for understandable reasons, they frown on counterfactuals. They basically say this, we have enough difficulty understanding what did happen in history. <laughs> Let's not mess around with what might have happened. To which I say, um, Jack, that on the contrary, speculating in a careful way, and I do think there are certain ground rules that one should follow, speculating about what might have occurred can help us better understand what did happen. So I think in this case, whether it's Vietnam, which of course is sort of the mother of all counterfactuals when it comes to Kennedy, or as you're asking about civil rights, I think if we look at what the administration was doing, saying and doing in those months prior to Dallas, then look at what LBJ did in the months after uh, the horrendous um, tragedy and how it ultimately then led to the legislation, I think we can 
better understand Johnson's ultimate role because you sort of isolate him from the equation. Um, that's just a sort of a, a, a sidebar on counterfactuals. But I think, yeah, again, uh, Jack, my answer to, to, to you, we can never know, of course, but we would have gotten, I believe, civil rights legislation, maybe not quite on the same timetable. Johnson had a way of, of you know, corralling people into line and moving things forward. And I don't doubt that the, the assassination, um, if you'll pardon the expression, helped him. It's, it served his purposes here. But I, I'm inclined to say we would have had very important civil rights legislation under a surviving Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, Catherine from the law school. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Um, I am from the law school. I am also an author and historian myself. So I'm very uh, excited about this conversation today. I just published my first book in September. It's called The Daughters of Yalta. Yeah. Um, oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Oh, pleasure to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'd love to meet you both in person sometime. Uh, hopefully when we're all back on campus and uh, you come through uh, Boston again, would love to say hello. Um, yes, so it's uh, great to chat today. And I, in, in my historical research and research, I love to look for the personal side of individuals who we think of on a pedestal, you know, presidents, prime ministers, and try to think of aspects of their lives that are not necessarily kind of the public figure. And so often that is, you know, family. Um, we think of a president kind of the head of the national family, but they are also part of their own family. And I think it's really fascinating to think of who, you know, we all have people in our lives who are invaluable to us, but who so often leave a very little footprint in the historical yeah. record. It's hard to pin you know, what exactly it is that make them so important, especially in moments of crisis where we you know, need to consult them on matters of conscience, need advice. But it's also you know, the, that person that we know that we can't get along without. And so I'm curious who in your opinion played that role in Kennedy's life? It, often mm -hmm. it is family, not always. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's more than one person. So would love mm -hmm. to, to hear your thoughts on that. Well, thank you, uh, Catherine. It's it's a it's a great question. Um, I think a person we haven't talked about tonight at all. I don't think she's come up even once. Who, at least to a degree, uh, served the function that you're describing as his sister, Kathleen. Uh, she was the sibling to whom he felt closest. She was the one who believed in him maybe more than any of the other siblings. She felt that it was Jack not Joe Jr., the supposed golden child. It was Jack, in, in, in she was known as Kick to everybody except her mother. It was Jack in Kick's view who was the one who would go far. Uh, and I think that was really important to him. And they were just so close in other respects. When he had a girlfriend, it was important for Kick to approve of the girlfriend. And so, you know, he would sometimes say to these, to these women, uh, you know, Kick needs to sort of um, say that you're okay. Um, but but uh, I think gave him really important confidence uh, at a key moment. She's killed in a plane crash in 1948. One of the things we haven't discussed uh, really are the tragedies that he experienced uh, and that I think must have had such an effect on him, losing Joe Jr., losing Kick, effectively losing Rosemary, the sibling who was closest to him in age to a botched lobotomy, uh, in late 1941, right before Pearl Harbor. But I think, Catherine, that she certainly, to a degree at least, served uh, in the way that you're describing. Uh, more familiar figures are important. Robert later on, I think, becomes important uh, as a family member. Um, and as I said before, I think I said this, that, that Rose, the mom, um, who's often slighted, it seems to me, in the scholarship. Who, who, because Joe Sr. is such a dominant figure, uh, she tends to recede. We should not underestimate the role that she played in all of this too. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Fred, give us a closing thought. Well, I guess my closing thought is first, uh, you know, I want to thank you, uh, John, and, and the, the questions we've got from, from everybody have been great. And for, to, to folks for tuning in, I hope you get a chance to read the book um, and that you like what you see uh, in the book. More substantively, I hope people take away from the book that uh, this is a 
life, but it's an important life um, of an American president who also, this is something we haven't really talked about here, John, but I think that, you know, one of the things that, that I'm trying to do, as you know, is tell the history in addition to telling uh, the story of Kennedy's life. But the fact that he's born in 1917, just as the United States is kind of uh, coming onto the world stage in a meaningful way, and then dies in 63, when the United States is this superpower of, of incomparable military and economic power, uh, it's an extraordinary period in our nation's history. And so maybe, this is the conceit, maybe we can understand the era better through uh, Kennedy's life. Uh, and I can somehow bring these two stories together. That's at least the, that's at least the hope. Yeah. Let me ask you one last thing. The yeah. contingency uh, yeah. is so important in what you just talked yeah. about. Um, there but for, uh, yeah. what's, what's the line? Uh, the Saturday Review called Sorensen corsicatingly brilliant. <laughs> and Kennedy said another 10,000 votes in Cook County and we'd all be corsicatingly stupid. Um, <laughs> so talk for a second about yeah. great person versus broader historical forces. Yeah. You are a historian and a biographer. Yeah. Uh, you just described how you're telling both. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a, a subject of eternal interest to me. Uh, and I think to you also, John, those of us who are historians, maybe especially if we're inclined to study decision-making and we're decide, decide we, we at least in part study leaders, we grapple with this. I think about this a lot. And I think about, for example, really quickly, that's even somebody like Winston Churchill. For all that he accomplished for Britain in World War II, he couldn't really win the war. He couldn't stop uh, the Germans from going deep into the Soviet Union. He couldn't certainly do what the Red Army then did in order, in order to defeat the Nazis. Winston Churchill couldn't save the British Empire as much as he wanted to do so. And of course, there are countless examples of this, but I sometimes think of Churchill as a um, as, as a figure that we should, we should coalesce around here. Um, nevertheless, I think to only emphasize structure, to only speak of subterranean forces in history uh, is, is, is insufficient. Uh, there are times, and you've written about this, uh, when an individual can make an enormous difference. Um, and again, we could point to Churchill himself. I could argue this one both ways, mm -hmm. but um, it is a, an endlessly fascinating story, isn't it? About the intersection between, as you say, contingency, human agency, interacting with forces that are beyond the control of any individual leader. Uh, it's, um, it's why I love, I love what you and I do. I love what we do. Well, one of the things I'm looking forward to in volume two here is to, and to finish the Kennedy-Lincoln uh, uh, comparison. Kennedy, like Lincoln, had a kind of fatalistic sense, right? Oh, yeah, no question. Life is tragic. You know, yeah. If somebody wants to get you, they'll get you. And yet they both gave their lives to the most human of enterprises. Yeah. And so that, that irony is, is so wonderfully thick. Uh, oh, beautifully but, said. But thank you, thank you. Uh, President Guerin, are you going to? Well, let me uh, jump in. Offer benediction. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you, John. What a rich and fascinating conversation. So I thank you very much for, for it. And to our great student questioners, particularly to Ryan for so intimidating, <laughs> our distinguished <laughs> moderator. We, we, uh, we look forward to having you back, John, and, and to learning more about your good work recently at Vanderbilt with some of the conversations you're having there on, on civic issues. So we, we thank you. Um, Thursday, the forum will return uh, in celebration of Black History Month, where we have uh, the important conversations of Black excellence in space and NASA with uh, Dr. Jeanette Epps, uh, an astronaut, uh, in conversation with uh, Charles Bolden, also an astronaut and the NASA administrator in the Obama administration. So we invite you back on Thursday, the 18th, at 6 p.m. And we end with our thanks to Fred and to John and for the really important conversation. John, Fred, I, I loved your book. I do commend it 
uh, to everyone. It really treats uh, the president's early years as well as his period in American history in such an adept way. So thank you for sharing so much of that. Thank with you, Mark. Me. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, John. Good night, everyone. See you all soon.